All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Paul Frields, and I'm uh, a manager at Red Hat. I manage the Fedora engineering team, uh, of whom I see several members here, which um, I was saying to Aurelion, uh, I, I can't tell whether to be amused or horrified by that, because mm -hmm. these folks really know how to get it done um, remotely. So I've learned something by working with them, I've learned something from working in Fedora before I joined Red Hat, and um, and also I owe uh, a debt of gratitude to um, John Polstra, uh, who's a good friend of mine and probably one of the best effectiveness gurus that I've ever met. I, I've never met anybody who's more devoted to like figuring out not only how to help himself work smarter and better, but also to help other people. And I, what what little that I've picked up over my years um, at Red Hat, um, a lot of that came from him. Um, so I'm going to try this LibreOffice remote. We're going to see how it works. Oh, it works. Awesome. Um, so, so I have a question. I guess I'll, I'll just look for a show of hands for these things. Um, how many of you have trouble staying focused uh, during your workday at home? A lot of people. So, um, and are not looking for strategies for productivity, right? You want to you want to make more value in a day. I mean, that's really what it's all about. It's not necessarily just about being able to produce for our employer, right? but also for ourselves, right? When we're more productive, when you're doing good work and you know that you've created good value, um, how would you say that makes you feel? Much better, right? So when you get done for the day and you know you've had a great day, I don't know, I, hopefully most of you are like me, you're just like, oh, I rocked it today. And then, you know, you can go and completely enjoy yourself um, in your downtime because you know, you're not worried about how am I gonna make up for what I didn't do today, tomorrow, right? And instead you're thinking, man, I really kicked butt and I hope I can keep that up tomorrow. And right now I'm gonna enjoy this, uh, this other time of my life. So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about some of those things here. The, the main thing that I wanna get across to folks here, and, and I'm not gonna be able to cover, obviously, every strategy that exists, um, but I'm gonna try and, and cover a few things that I think are important and the rationale behind them um, and I'm going to leave some time at the end so we can maybe talk about your tips, right? Because it's not all about what I do. Um, I realize that my approach works for me. It may not work for everybody. It may not work for some of you at all. Right? You do have to kind of find your own way, but you want to understand why and what you're trying to do. Um, for, for me, the key really is that you focus on your approach um, to working remotely, your approach to being productive. It's not necessarily about a tool, and, and that isn't to say that tools aren't important, right? But the thing about a tool is it's not going to solve your productivity issues because of the fact, because of the fact that it exists, right? It's only being, in being able to use it and being able to be mindful about using it, right? So what you have to do in order um, to really maximize your productivity uh, is commit to, to changing your mindset Right? You have to really be mindful about what you're doing during the day and, and be mindful about what you're doing during an hour and be mindful what you're doing sometimes, minute to minute, especially when things are, are very distracting. Um, and this is not dissimilar from fitness. Now, now I, you know, obviously, I'm not a paragon of fitness. No one's ever gonna mistake me for uh, you know, um, uh, Clive Owen or, uh, you know, or Josh Boyer, I guess. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but, but I, you know, one of the things that I, that I found um, came from my trying to be more mindful about productivity was also being more mindful about myself and my own body. And so, you know, there was a period of time where I lost about 40 pounds. Um, actually, I lost a little more than that, but a little bit of it has crept back and I'm trying to get a, a handle on that. So it's always a battle. But I found that the mindset was the most important thing, right? It's, to, to stop thinking about myself negatively and about what I could accomplish negatively, and instead starting to embrace just positive things, right? And little things, one at a time. And if you do that for productivity, that will work for you too, right? And it's not to say that, it, that it's not a struggle. It's a struggle for me also to be productive day to day sometimes. It can be very difficult when things are distracting. But you take each hour and each day as it comes and realize that if you didn't do the best job an hour ago or yesterday, Every single hour, every single day is another chance to turn it around. Right? That's a great thing about productivity. You can, you can always do better, and even if you failed before, you can get it right next time. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal a little bit here um, from, um, from Franklin Covey, 
uh, because I feel like they explain why you would want to embrace productivity, why you would want to think about the things that you're doing day to day instead of just acting like a conveyor belt for tasks. And so the way they do this is by uh, graphing basically the kind of things that happen over the course of the day, the kind of issues or situations that arise that you have to deal with. And this goes for everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're a fry cook at McDonald's or you're a knowledge worker or you're a senior executive somewhere or whether you're a business owner. All of these things apply equally, right? And so the way this graph works is basically think about these four quadrants in terms of importance and urgency. And remember that those are two very different things. Something can be very important, but it may not be urgent that you get it done right away. So here are some examples. So um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about what these things are. So something that's not important and not urgent. Typically, this is trivia, right? Busy work. It's it's stuff that you're um, basically wasting your time on. Who has some examples of things that might be wasting your time or, or is what? Facebook and Twitter. Those are excellent examples. Un unless, of course, your primary job, right, is as a social media maven. It might be important then, but for most of us, it's not. Expense, expense reports. Expense reports. Expense reports. <laughs> I, actually, I would I would tend to disagree with expense reports. I would yeah. I would tend to call that important because you don't want to pay for those expenses. But I would also say it's not urgent that you do it right now, right? Okay. I, but I, but that's a, I think that was a great point. Uh, Swales. So Meetings. We were just making Meetings. Silly jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some meetings can be in there too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so an example of something that's not important but is urgent, right? What kind of thing could be not important but it's urgent? What about when somebody comes by your desk and like does a drive-by meeting that you weren't intending to have, right? Because you're in the middle of something else, um, an interruption. I, what I call the SEP, right? Someone else's problem, right? It's someone else's problem. They brought it to you because they really just don't want to handle it, but they want to give it to you. And um, I know we have at least one other manager in here, and I'm sure, you know, the, the Harvard monkeys, right? Uh, somebody's already always trying to give you their monkeys. Um, as a, but it's not just as a manager. If you, if you lead anything at all, this can happen as well. Um, and some meetings, right? Someone urgently needs to meet with you, but it's, they may think they need to urgently meet with you, but it may not be that urgent for you, right? And what it may mean is, I haven't really figured out what to do here, and rather than writing an email, it's a lot easier for me to come grab 30 minutes of your time now. That may be disastrous for you because you're in a zone and you know you just got popped out of it. What about pastries in the kitchen? Pastries in the kitchen, yes. <laughs> urgent, <laughs> urgent that you get the pastries before they disappear. Maybe not important though, right? Especially if you're me. Definitely not important for me. Um, okay, what about things that are very important and very urgent? Those are, these are emergencies, right? True emergencies. These are things that really are your job to handle. Something critical came up. What's a good example of this? Anybody on my team? Fire. Something's on fire in the infrastructure. Security problem, right? You didn't plan it. It came up urgently, right? But it's very important that you handle it, right? So something with a real short deadline. Okay, any other examples? Um, and finally, there are these things that are important and not urgent, right? Things that it really is important to do. They, they have very high value, but they don't need to be done right now. What do a lot of us do with those things? What do we do? <laughs> Procrastinate, right? We put them off, right? What happens when you put things like that off too long? They can become urgent. Yeah, they can become urgent, exactly. They can, they can easily move into this next quadrant. Other things that can happen, they can wither on the vine, right? So some of the things that are, are examples, right? Strategy and planning. But this isn't just about strategy of what you're doing at work. Think about planning your family vacation, right? I would say that that's important, but not urgent. It's important to your family that you spend some time with them and, and, and do something fun over the summer for a week. But it's easy to put that off because you have so many other things going on, right? We all say that to ourselves sometimes. Well. There's so much going on right now, I really can't think about this. And you may be right, right? This is not to say that you're not, a, you're not absolutely right. What I'm, I guess what I, the pitch that I'm making is that making time for that is important. Uh, relationships, I think, of all kinds, uh, both at work, uh, at home, your spouse or significant other, your kids, your parents, relatives, friends, 
those are all important too, right? Not urgent, because most of those people are not intruding on your work day. But if you don't deal with those relationships and instead put it, always put it off till tomorrow, bad things happen, right? I mean, not to get too you know, goofy or sentimental about it, but you know, no one ever died on their hospital bed and said, I wished I'd spend more time at the office. <laughs> that never happens, right? Well, maybe it does, but that person would be very sad. In my book, so I don't want to be that person. So, um, so what do you do with these things? Well, for again, for these trivial things, avoid them. These are things that you want to avoid. Things that are not important but are urgent, right? Those are things where somebody else is kind of creating an issue for you that's not important to you but is urgent, maybe only to them. You want to limit those. You can't always stop those, right? Like, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on Denise since she's here, right? If Denise comes to me with something that you know is is really important because you know maybe her her manager or some other manager came to her and she has something to give to me, and I'm not saying this has happened, right? I, mean, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to make a career limiting move here in my presentation, but you know Denise may give me something, and for me it may not be it may not be urgent, so I'm I'm gonna try and, and limit those things. So I will you know try and do them as I can, right? But you know not every single thing that comes around is going to take my attention right now. Uh, important, uh, or I'm sorry, important and urgent things. These are things that you need to manage, right? And it doesn't mean that you don't do them, right? You may be personally involved in actually handling those, but you have to manage them. In other words, you have to see what needs to be done right now and separate that from the things that need to be done maybe a little further out to handle that crisis, right? And some of it is going to mean working with your team, working with other people that you know, working with other contributors. Right, to make sure that they get handled. But it doesn't necessarily mean you do every single piece of it yourself. And finally, the things that are important and not urgent, these long-term things, the things that are really give value to your life and to your work, um, are the things that you want to focus on and make sure that you have time to do those things. Right, so here's, and I have some examples. The great thing is you guys kind of called out a lot of these, which is great, like, you know, Facebook down here in the trivia pile. Where I am like reorganizing files. How many people have like, have you ever gone to your, like, you know, folders in your uh, in your system are just like, oh my God, this is a god awful mess. And how am I ever gonna like? I don't know how I'm gonna find documents. And so you start spending time shifting things from one place to another. I have done that once in a while. It's it's the worst. Um, so not important to write all hands Q and A, right? Um, I could probably go. I could probably go watch the the video of that later if I yeah, sure. to go. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Phone call from mom, right? I, I this is a joke, right? Some phone calls from mom may be very important. Right? So we all love our moms, but you know, your mom may call you with something that she thinks is really urgent, and it may not be like, "What am I going to make for your party this Saturday?" <sighs> well, gee, mom, that's a really good question. But I can call you at six tonight, and we can talk about it then. But right now, I'm like in the middle of a crisis, so I'll, I'll get back with you. And one of those crises might be like, you know, outages, sick kid at school. There, that's important and urgent. You have to know. But these important and not urgent things, again, this is where you want to spend more of your time if you want to feel good about what you're doing. Things like you know, making a career plan. Where do I want to be in a year or two years or five years from now? Um, how am I going to architect this project? What, what, are the long, what are the long-term goals for this project? How am I going to roadmap this out so that we actually have a chance of completing milestones on time? Who am I going to involve? I'm thinking about big things like that. Hacking. I would also say hacking. Whatever it is that you're hacking is important and not urgent. That's where you get in your zone and you're really working on something that you that you needed to complete, right? But you can, it's very easy to put off because you have other things going on, other crises. So this, and that's where you really get in that zone. So this, if you, if you want to be productive, then one of the things that you would want to do is try and maximize the time you spend here in this focus area, this area of important things that are not urgent but the more of them you get done, the more everything else in your life will fall in place. All right, so how can we increase that focus? Well, to me, it's three things. Managing your time, managing your environment, and managing your attention. Those are the things that have worked for me. Um, these, these, uh, these areas do bleed into each other a bit, right? Like you might say, well, isn't managing my attention really managing my time? Well, I think about them a little differently. I think about managing time as like actually managing time itself as a resource, um, whereas managing environment is sort of managing those things that are external to you that affect how you deal with that time. 
And managing your attention is managing what's internal to you. Again, managing your mindset so that, uh, so that you can increase uh, the effectiveness of those time blocks. Does that make sense? Okay, all right, so if everybody buys into that, then hopefully the rest of this is gonna make sense. Um, so, managing your time. Just check my time. Um, so, one of the things you can do to manage your time is think about when you get your best daily focus. When, when's the time that you best focus around? 10 minutes after I wake up. 10 minutes after you yeah. wake up, you're on. Yeah. Is there a time, Does is it the same all day or do you have? And then 40 minutes after that, I'm done. 40 minutes after <laughs> that. <laughs> so what that really was saying is I am gonna work 40 minutes in a day and then I can do all, nothing but my best work, right? Right now, okay, I, that doesn't mean that. But yeah, that, there, but there are those periods, right? Um, uh, so John, what about you? Where, what's, when, when's your best time to focus during the day? When do you find you get your best stuff done? Yeah, yeah. So, um, if I had the opportunity, unfortunately, I have to eat these things. Um, <laughs> but I was able to do a lot of work until 10 30. Yeah, and, yeah. And then I could focus. Yeah, so, so 11 o'clock. But, but that, so that interesting for, for you, that's also kind of early in the day, right? Or it would be early in your day if you could make it that way, right? <laughs> right. Not for those pesky meetings. Um, you know, and a lot of people actually um, answer very similarly. Um, you know, morning times are good. Times, I think that more, more often than not, people say that some of their low times are after lunch for usually a couple hours, and usually a bit of a resurgence towards the, the evening. Um, interestingly, these are also the times where we are least, th those, those high energy times are the times where we are less likely to come in contact with other people. Right, because you get in and the first thing is you can kind of figure out what you're doing. When are you going to sign on you know, to IRC? When are you going to you know, pull your email or something? You can make those decisions early in the morning. As things happen during the day, you get drawn into stuff that you didn't plan necessarily, but still that you need to spend time on, you need to spend your attention on. But it's harder than to get your internal focus because you're really then thinking about things that you're doing for or on behalf of or um, with other people, okay? Um, but thinking about when you have your best, your best focus is important because that's the time, you know, again, we're talking about managing time, that's when you want to set aside some blocks of time to do these, you know, again, this, uh, this, this golden, this golden um, quarter, right, this golden area of focus. You want to do that during the time that's best for you. Um, I actually start work pretty early usually, a lot, I think a lot earlier than, than people in my time zone who are, you know, who are in this field, the IT field. Um, and starting early like that helps me because I can get an hour or two hours out of the day where really no one's sending anything out yet. They're kind of still waking up and, and uh, that's a great time for me to be productive. Unfortunately, like John, it's also not my favorite way to live. I, I, would, I would love to actually start later. I'm not a morning person either, but I found that, that, that what I can get out of it helps me, so great. Although, like John, the early morning meetings sometimes make that, make that hard. Um, so, but, but again, the, the idea here is that you want to set aside some time that makes sense for you for that focus work. And when you set aside time, it's not necessarily about taking an hour every day to think about your career, right? Because inevitably that becomes wasteful. Um, or it can become, you know, it can easily turn to, well, I'm just not sure what's happening today. It's very easy for that to become a little bit self-defeating. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's very easy for that to become self-defeating. So. Really, when it comes to very long-term plans, you're not thinking about an hour per day that you want to spend on those, but it might be an hour a week or an hour a or a couple hours every month that you want to think about long-term plans. Right? If I'm thinking about what I need to get done this quarter um, at Red Hat, I'm usually going to spend an hour or so a month seeing how I did, like, and maybe not all at once, but spread out over a few weeks to see how things are coming together. Right? And over you know over a year. I may spend a few hours every year thinking about what's my long-term plan for, um, you know, our finances at home. Um, you know, what am, what are we going to do about you know handling college for my daughter, for my oldest daughter, things like that. Um, each day, I'm going to spend a few minutes thinking about what are the things that I absolutely must, that I absolutely have to get done today in order to feel like I created great value. 
and I'll map those things out. And by doing that, it gives me a little bit of a, a roadmap for the day, right? And then when I have those things crossed off at the end of the day because I was mindful about it, I feel way better about my whole day. Right? Doesn't always happen though, right? I'm unsuccessful at that more, you know, more often than I probably like to admit. But having a plan means that I can at least judge how I did and not say, I'm not sure how well I did today, I'm not sure what I focused on. At least I know and can think about what I did and be successful or what I failed at, right? And try and do better tomorrow. So one way to do this is you know manage by a sprint period. You know, you might um, in order to focus better, you might chop up your time into several one-hour periods or maybe 30-minute periods or whatever works for you. In some jobs, that may not be possible. You may need to, uh, you know, either, either splitting the day up like that may not be possible or, you know, you may need to find a time slice that's different depending on you know, what, your, what kind of granularity your focus needs to come at. So how do you do this? How do you manage the time? Well, for one thing, you have to have a calendar. If you don't keep a calendar, you're going to be up a tree. So you have to keep a calendar. And best case scenario, you have one calendar. Having one calendar for work, one calendar for home life, one calendar that you know your kids are on, does not work. Right? At least it doesn't for me. Because you're never going to be able to easily make commitments to people without having to check a lot of things at once. And it means that it takes you more time than to figure out whether you can commit to something. And that, uh, that uncertainty can make you less sure of your own effectiveness, right? So being able to manage everything in one place really does help. I also am a firm believer in this. Some people call this cheating, and I think that that's asinine. I think it absolutely makes sense to block and pre-schedule time to do focused work. So for example, Friday after, well now I, I'm, I'm going to spill my secret here, but Friday afternoon I block four hours in the afternoon every Friday, right? And it's not because I want to slip off to the pub and have an early beer, it's because, huh? That's why I do it. Yeah, that's why I, I, I And I fully, I fully support you in that. I, I, I'm all for the beer. Um, but for me, what I've found is that over those, that four hour period, that is the time period where more often than not, I found that people were coming to me with those not important but urgent things that they're trying to offload so that they can have a weekend free of worrying about them. <laughs> my job is not for them to have a worry-free weekend. My job is to get my job done and do it well. And hopefully, I have a worry-free weekend, right? And you know, and if it's, if it's, again, if it's not urgent for me to handle, and I know that it's not urgent for me to handle, it can wait till Monday, right? So, um, so I like to block that time, and I use that for things that I have that I have to focus on. And for one thing, I can use it to clean up. If I didn't have a great week, I now have some time I can recover, right? And if I'm doing a good job, if I've had a great week, often I'll remove the block and say, okay, if somebody's going to call me today and really need my attention, I can do that in good conscience because I was really productive the last few days. Yeah. So what do you do if you get the call and it's in the middle of your block and you don't take it out? Or? I'm sorry. What do you do if you get the call? Oh, what do you do if you get a if I you mean, get a call? You have to talk to them to determine mm -hmm. if it's a not my problem or it's yeah. fire. Yeah, yeah. Well, so there are ways to do that. So, um, it, you know, you talk about taking a call, right? And and as a remote person, I do have the option of picking up or not picking up the phone, right? Mm -hmm. And it does depend on who it is. Like, I'm I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, if Denise calls me directly, I'm picking up the phone. Right? That's going to happen. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, well, no, but, and, and, uh, and you, you're you're always welcome to call Denise. Okay, and I said that to the camera, so they, they call me. Um, on the other hand, if it's uh, you know, I might not pick up the phone necessarily. Uh, it depends on what's going on, right? If we're if we're on a short deadline and you know someone's calling from a product team, I certainly am going to take that call. On the other hand, if I'm getting you know, if it's somebody that I've never spoken to, I can't really identify who it is on the caller ID, I'm like, I don't know who that person is and why they'd be calling, chances are I won't pick it up, right? And I'll, st I'll instead be working on what I'm working on because I know that they'll send me an email or something. based on the relationship with the person. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, well, the other thing is as you build relationships, right, you know how much someone, you know how well someone values your time, right? And this isn't, to, I, I don't mean to sound like I place a higher value on my time or, or that my time somehow has more value than anyone else's. To me it does, 
but they may really have something important. But as I get to know people, right, they know whether or not it's worth calling on a Friday afternoon to hand off a monkey to me, right? So, uh, so yes, relationships absolutely affect it. But you know, this is one of those things that you can actually take charge of, and and I and I admit it's hard to do. It doesn't come easy, but you do have the power to do this. This is one of those things that you can affect. Um, Sorry, I keep squeezing the, the button here. Um, also, these Pomodoro timers are really useful too. Has anybody used Pomodoro method for hacking? Yeah. yeah. Well, you want to explain that for people, just since I'm tired of yakking? Actually, you define some amount of time, something short, for example, half an hour, and you are trying to focus on that task, completing the task in that half an hour. And then after that, you have like five minutes for a break, and then another like uh, time window starts. So you get like eight time windows. Mm -hmm. yep, absolutely, yeah, so just so the camera will pick it up. So yeah, the explanation was perfect, which is you basically are slicing up your, your work period into specific times, and you sprint during that time towards an, a specific goal, and at the end of that time you take a short break, and then you come back again, and it's sort of enforced. You can actually get a plug-in, uh, or I'm sorry, an extension for GNOME 3, that it's, uh, it's a Pomodoro timer, and it will actually it will actually lock your screen so you and not take any more keyboard inputs so you can get up and go take a break. So it enforces that sprint mentality. It's, it's kind of useful. I don't really do this a lot, but I've heard other people tell me that it's useful. Um, all right, so that was time. Environment. Um, how do you manage the environment? What distractions do you have? I find that if I have a if I have a clean desk and a clean desktop on my computer, I work so much better because I'm not thinking about what that thing is and why it's here. So, and I feel like a physical desk, doing this with your physical desk, how, how many people would agree with this statement? When my desk is clean, I feel like I'm awesome. Right? I feel like that. And it's, that's not to say that my desk is clean all the time. If you went to my office right now, you would cringe. It's, my office face is in a horrible shape right now. But I also know that once I clean that up, when I clean that up after I return, it's going to be great. I'm going to feel great about that for the day. So it's it's a great way to, to keep a simple and clean work environment. Really, really helps your your focus because you're not being distracted by things. Um, and this goes for uh, for sound too, right? If you're remote, you have the hopefully have the option maybe to control sound in your environment. And you might do that in a number of ways. You might do it by playing music that helps you focus. You might do it by not playing music because you like silence. You might do it by wearing noise-canceling headphones if you're in a shared environment or if you're in a, a coffee shop, right? You put those on, it allows you to isolate a little bit if that, if that helps you. You need to find what works well for you. What I found works for me, and you know, this is, this is just me, I, I do not work well in silence because what I find is that when I hear, when something makes a sound around me, and it could be my wife coming downstairs, uh, it could be one of the kids tromping across the floor. It could be a, a lawnmower starting up next door. That sound really breaks me out of my out of my zone. So I cover it up with you know music that has no words and usually music that I'm unfamiliar with. And that way I can't start you know humming along with it or singing because I know it well. And uh, you know what works for me is like improvisational jazz or soundscapes or something like that where I don't know what's happening. It just kind of covers up my uh, that silence. That's just me. Spotify has this wonderful playlist mm -hmm. called Deep Focus. Okay. Spotify, so Spotify Deep Focus playlist. Yeah, I, I'm actually I'm using um, Google Music now for that too. They they have uh, they have radio stations, and so I started to discover a lot of things that are working for me. Um, but yeah, find a playlist that you like with things that you know. Um, all right, so what are some tools to manage your environment? Well, I, I covered a little bit of this already, which is you know. Have a desktop without icons. This is what I love about GNOME 3 is I can't put anything on the desktop anymore. I know that was something that they originally took away, but it's been great for me because it it now I don't think about things that are sitting on my desktop anymore. It's only there to hold what I'm working on. Uh, I put away windows I'm not using. I keep a waste basket in my office so I don't have to get up and break out of my zone to throw something away. Uh, I turn off notifications if I really need to focus. Right? I have a notifier, so when somebody pings me online on IRC, I'll see it. If I really need to focus for a little while, I'll turn that off. Right, and that way I can't be interrupted. Um, because you know, again, there are a number of ways people can can find me. Like, you know, I, I may turn my IRC notifier off, but my phone is on, and I know if somebody reaches out for me by cell phone, it's going to be important because most, you know, let's let's be honest, most of us around Fedora, Red Hat, the IT sector don't pick up a phone 
uh, to call people. We prefer to just you know engage lightly. And so if somebody calls me, I know it's really important. Um, so again, use silence, music, or noise, um, whatever works for you. So finally, there's managing attention. This is that uh, that inner the inner piece, um, P I E C E, the inner factor. Um, and hopefully, there's also inner piece, inner piece, kung fu Um the most difficult part of managing your attention is being mindful, right? And it's and it's about reaching this balance between being mindful of what you're doing and not continually going to a meta level where you're questioning constantly what you're doing because that can interrupt you just as much um, as not being mindful at all. So it's about striking that balance, right? Knowing what you're doing and why and then being able to let it go and get in the flow and do what you need to do. Um, taking in inventory. I, what, what helped me a lot was for two weeks, um, and this was probably the, after I'd worked at Red Hat for about six months, um, I realized I didn't feel like I was getting as much done as I was capable of. And so what I started doing is for two weeks, I tracked my time. Um, and so I, if I got done checking email, for example, I would write down at this point, I, I finished checking email. And then I, I did this with a, an app, I did it with an app, with an app in GNOME called Hamster and I was tracking my time with that. And then at the end of a few weeks, I went back and looked at it and saw how my time was being spent. And I was shocked to find out how much time I was wasting, for example, checking email, right? It was a go-to, it was very easy to go pull email. Instead of working on this you know, important but not urgent thing, I would go read email because it was a way of procrastinating, it was a way of not facing that. Um, so I had to kind of admit that to myself and then realize okay, I need to fix this, I need to do better. How, how am I going to do that? How am I going to reapportion my time so that it works better? Um, context switching. If you have to switch context, it takes you out of the zone, right? This is, again, you know, when you have those drive-by meetings or uh, you know, where somebody walks by your cube or um, you, know, you get a phone call at home, you're working from home and you get a phone call from, I don't know, your landlord or the guy who comes and trims your bushes or something like that. So. Managing, uh, managing your attention, knowing what that context switching is going to cost you is important. Um, and finally, avoid non-related tasks during core focus time. So this, again, part of managing attention is taking responsibility for your attention. It's taking responsibility for your mindset. And if you're going to be concentrating on something, really do it. You have to really commit to it. And that means you know, knowing I am during the next 30 minutes, I am not going to go check email. I am not going to do these other things that could cost me you know, time that I really want to be spending on this other thing. And so sometimes that means putting off the, you know, maybe a quick, you know, quick hit or the little adrenaline bump or, or the little, you know, the little uh, heart swelling that you might get by going to Facebook and seeing how many people just liked your post or something like that. You have to put that off in favor of something that's going to have more lasting value. Um, and you know, again, I this 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 really, it, 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 this whole idea just to me, it parallels so much the, the struggle um, that I go through for physical fitness. And it's all about, you know, it, it's, it's such a big analogy between this, this mental fitness and the physical fitness. And again, it's not that I do a great job of it, but I really do try. And I think other people you know, can, can speak to the problems that they've had in doing that and think about bringing that same kind of idea to how you're mindful about what you do every day. So again, it's not about doing a perfect job, it's about each day trying to do a good job. Okay, so what are some tools that you can use to help manage your attention? And this is difficult, right? Because you know, this attention, this mindfulness is, is really from, from internal. But there are tools that you can get that will allow you to express your mindfulness and track it. And, and what's important is not that you were mindful yesterday, but that you have the ability to prove to yourself that you were mindful. Right? It's, it's giving yourself the evidence to know that you did a good job. And that will help boost your confidence and it will help get you on a treadmill of doing it well. Task and to-do list. If you are existing without a to-do list, a, a, real, a really honest to-do list, a task list, if you're existing without that, you, there is no possible way to be fully productive. Because you have to be able to track what you've done in order to prove to yourself that you're attaining those long-term goals. For short-term goals, what I like to do is I'll take a piece of paper or a little, you know, a notepad that I leave open on the uh, on a, on on one or the other of my of my screens, 
that tells me what my goals are for today. Some people really like to write those things down um, on, in a physical notepad. That, that's great. You know, use whatever tool works for you. But have a short-term goal for a time period. By the, end of, by the end of this hour, or by lunchtime, I'm going to have completed the following thing, right, or things, right? And then that helps you focus, how am I doing? It's 10.30, noon is coming, I'm gonna eat lunch at noon, that means I have 90 minutes left. You'll be surprised what that adding time pressure to yourself will make you achieve. Right. And something that I do on the computer is I maximize the app that I'm using so I don't drift from place to place or look, oh, look, I left that browser open with, uh, with Facebook open. Maybe I should go close that. Oh, oh, what? It's on the screen. Maybe I should look at this. And, you know, it's real easy to fall into that trap. I'm, I, I'm just as bad as anyone at that. So you know, I try and maximize the app I'm using so that I, I stay where I need to be or tab for that. Um, so, so task list. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna draw in some ideas here um, from David Allen, who is a master at this, and he it, he does simplify this a bit, but it's a really good place to start thinking about things as things that you have to do, right? For any task that you have, anything that you're supposed to do, there are three decisions that you can make with it. You can defer it, you can delegate it, or you can do it. All right, and this is and so this is about getting those short-term things done so that you are achieving a long-term goal. So if it's something that you're supposed to do, you really do need to do it, but you're not going to be able to do it in a few minutes. It's, it's going to take much more time than that. You need to defer. You defer that, right? The next thing is if you're not if you're not responsible for it, or at least you're not responsible for the next thing, you delegate it. And delegate doesn't mean that you you know call someone who works for you and have them do it. It might be that you're you're looking for something from a teammate. Well, for Denise it might, but for for, for others of us it doesn't necessarily work. Though. Um, you know, it may not work, but it may not work like say I'm working on a, that vacation project, and I need to know, you know, what is my wife? Where where does she want to go? Does she want to go to the beach, or does she want to go to the mountains? I, I can't I can't tell. So she's responsible for the next step. So I'm going to tell her, you decide which of these do you want to do, and then get back to me, and then I'll take it from there you know, to the next step. Right. So that that would be an example of delegating. Right. I'm not truly delegating there because of course I work for her and not vice versa. Um, Finally, if I'm responsible for the next step and it's only going to take me a few minutes to do, like let's say five minutes or ten minutes, whatever makes sense, do it. Just do it right now. Get it done. Right. So that sounds very easy. What is? What do I mean by defer? Do I mean put it off forever? No, that's not what defer means. What it means is that if this is a big project, you need some time to focus on it and complete it. So you're going to look at it as one of those focus tasks. It might be that you don't understand what to do next there in order to make progress. So you're gonna use that focus time to break it down and figure out what you do need to do next. Maybe some of it you're not really responsible for, but if you don't know that, it's gonna sit in your box or your task list forever and no progress will be made. But if you break it down and figure out who is, you can start to make some progress on it. Um, and again, this deferring things, this means that sometimes that that thing is going to fall into that golden that golden quadrant that golden quarter of being important but not urgent. So you're going to spend focused time on it. Now, and this isn't to say that if something is a big project, if if it's a critical or an urgent thing, it's it's actually okay to make an exception to deferring to make an exception to the defer rule. Normally, the defer thing is, yeah, I'm supposed to do this, but it's going to take me more than a few minutes. Well, obviously. If it's critical, if it's like the infrastructure breaks down, you know, I expect that Kevin Fenzie's not going to go. Well, it's probably going to take me forty or fifty minutes to diagnose this, so I'm just going to put it off because yeah. that's just I'm too big. Beers with yeah, that's, yeah, beers. Beer sounds so much better, and it only takes me five minutes to drink a beer. That's something I should do. Whereas fifty minutes to troubleshoot this, I should defer that. Now you're thinking like the monkey. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so it is okay, obviously, to make exceptions for those, for those critical things. That's I'm crazy. sorry to say. But fortunately, you, well, within reason, you can drink beer while you're troubleshooting. I'm not saying you should. <laughs> I'm just saying it's physically possible to do it. Okay, task list. How do we get tools for this? Well, they're all over the place. A lot of people are into you know, these card systems like Trello or Taiga or Canboard or whatever, the, whatever they need. Those, you know, they're used for methods like Kanban and Scrum and things like that. But you can use them on a personal level as well. You can get an app for your phone or whatever, whatever strikes your fancy. A lot of people on my team, and I use this too, Task Warrior, which is a command line utility. It's super, super duper for keeping project and task lists. 
There's all sorts of cool things that, like Ralph Bean has made all these little hooks that allow you to get your bugs and other things that just come into your task list so you can easily get, get through things quickly. There's even, a, there's even a synchronization server out there called nd.am, which allows you to get it on any mobile client and synchronize across multiple systems. But you may not need something like that. Maybe you're looking for just a liberal scratch pad, Evernote, or Remember the Milk, or Google Keep, or whatever you decide works for you. It might be as simple as a paper notebook. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Pierre just held up a paper notebook. You know, paper notebook. If you're and if you want to get you know real hipster cool, you get like one of these moleskin notebooks, and you talk about how it's got like you know organic, you know whatever <laughs> skin of the immature naga on the outside or whatever. They still use that joke. The, the Naga Hyde joke also that those days. Anyway, yeah, so anything from you know paper up to something automated that works for you. Okay, so we talked a lot about these tools. Now, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit in the few minutes we have left. Oh, wow, we really only have a few minutes left to talk about something that someone asked me about, which is I'm remote, and this is all great productivity stuff is great, but how do I make sure that, like, as a remote person, that I'm not just inwardly facing. Like, how do I focus outward? How do I how do I deal with the team? And these are some examples of, of building um, remote trust. Right, building uh, building your productivity is not just about what you can do. It's also about what you can enable others to do or what you can help others with. So the things that you the, the tools that you use here are not anything that is that's going to be a shock to anybody. It's keeping up with them, um, showing interest, and, and 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 being interested in what people are doing. Um, it might be, you know, this doesn't happen necessarily on every team. Some teams like to do like a weekly video call. They have regular communications channels. In Fedora, we use IRC for this. Um, your manager, if you're a remote guy, if you're not having a regular one-on-one -on -one with your manager, you're doing it wrong because they cannot possibly understand the value of what you're doing when you don't have a chance to talk to them about it. So if your manager has put off doing that, get them to schedule something. Um, let's see. Uh, and also, if you manage somebody, you should be doing it for them as well. So I guess I, that one way is from you to your manager. I, if you are a manager, you should be doing this. Um, communicate effectively and concisely. If you're a remote person and you write enormous, like, eight-paragraph emails, stop it. Stop it. it it's, that is, it's, it's the worst thing ever for communication, to at least to your manager, right? If you're, or to people on your team. If you want to build remote trust, you have to be concise. Lay out the problem. Oh, sorry, did I, was that that close to that? <laughs> that wasn't meant to be personal. And actually, so the funny thing is, I used to write these really long emails. I'm sure, Denise, you remember, and I've gotten way better in the last few years because I realized I was not getting what I wanted out of the email, which was attention and, and, and a response, right? That's what I want. I want somebody to understand what I'm telling them, and I want them to be able to respond. And so to do that, I had to change my communication method. Um, and finally, whether you're a manager or whether you're a person reporting to a manager, deliver what you commit to. If you say you're going to do something, do it. That's as simple as that. If you're not getting it done, then figure out what's keeping you from that. And maybe you need to discuss that with your manager. That, that's a great way to talk uh, you know, to a manager one-on-one. -on -one. And I've, again, experienced that from both sides now. Um, that sounds like a Joni Mitchell song, doesn't it? Can I throw one again? Yeah, absolutely. Go, Denise. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So just so the camera mic picks it up, Denise made the point that if you're not going to get it done, it's okay to admit that. Just don't wait till the last minute to do that, right? You don't want to wait till the deadline. Say, ah, I couldn't get it done if it's important. Yeah. Yeah, there, that's, that's actually a really good point. Those someone else's problems, those can actually mean political capital or, or personal, it could be building your personal brand, right, as somebody who can solve a problem. So it's not to say that you should never solve anyone's problem, right? The whole idea, I think that was limit, right? Like I said, that the right way to handle those is limit. In other words, if, that, if handling that person's problem is going to be, well, if it's going to be easy for you, if it's not going to be easy but it has value for you, or if you are trying to build that relationship or your personal brand with it, absolutely you can do it. On the other hand, if you don't limit it, you could end up solving everyone's problems except yours, right? So there's, there's a balance to be struck. Um, and I'm running a little bit over, so I'm going to try and scooch this. So the remote water cooler, 
it's all about building relationships and and speak up if you're if you are a remote e and you're not getting what you need let people know right don't be afraid to be the squeaky wheel because that's how as remote ease we can be involved and i say this as somebody who has you know is on the remote side so you know sometimes has to speak up and say how am i going to learn about this is there going to be a dial in are we you know are we having a video call for this because i'm not in the same place with some of these folks right but when you do that be prepared to really participate right if you make a big deal about going to a going to a remote like a remote call in and then you show up and you basically start your computer doing other things, you're not building up trust that way. So you have to be prepared to, to do your part. Is it? Um, so some resources, Getting Things Done by David Allen, well worth reading, won't take you but a couple hours. Um, it's not about applying his method verbatim, but it will teach you about how to make good decisions about things and how you organize them. Time Management for System Administrators, legendary book, really good, and it directly influences how people can work really well in IT. And I got a thumbs up from Kevin. So yeah, that's good work. And there are websites out there that are great. Workawesome.com is a fun one. Um, and finally, here's some tips, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal three minutes just to see, uh, I'm gonna grab like the first three people who put up a hand, give me one tip that's helped you as a remote person. Anybody? Yes, sir. Keep your work space and your rest space to the state. Keep your workspace and your rest space completely distinct. I absolutely agree with that. I have a home office and it has a door. That door closes when I'm done for the day and I spend all my time in the rest of the house. So that is my office and when I leave the office, I'm at home. Yes? If you can manage it, no work email on your phone. Sorry? No work email on your phone. If you, if you can manage it, don't put work email on your phone. I, I would agree with that too because again, I'm at, when I'm at work, I can easily reach my email at all times. When I'm gone from the house, my phone is with me because I'm doing something with, with my family or friends or band or whatever the case may be. If someone needs me, they will call me. If it's urgent, they will call. So they will be able to ele elevate that from something that I need to handle at some point to, oh my God, this is burning, you have to handle it now, right? People will make that decision and they'll let me know. Yes? To dress like if I'm at work, like uh, in coffee, so I feel like I'm going to Yep, if you're remote, so if you're remote, go to the office, even if it's in your house, as if you're going to work. Dress for the office, like no bathrobe and fuzzy slippers or anything like that. Yeah, I yeah, I absolutely agree, because it puts you in the mindset of being uh, of being at work, right? And being in that professional context. So it's about setting up that space. Excellent, those are awesome tips. I know people probably have other tips as well. Um, if you guys want to share them, um, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly what we should do. Does does anybody have any uh, uh, an idea for like how we might want to to do that after this? Yeah, I'll just set up like a wiki page maybe on the Fedora wiki if you guys want to. I'll just call it like I guess I'm going to call it remote tips. I'll, I'll set up a page for that and we'll and, we'll, and I'll put it on the um, the Slack uh, the URL on the Slack thing. There is one thing which you did not mention. It's a little bit of the opposite problem. Is don't forget to step out. Don't step. And don't be afraid to step out. In, in other words, and stop being productive, right? Not to stop work at the end of the day, because if you steal that, you're basically running into the house. Yeah. Set up limits. Yeah. Set up limits, right? Everybody has days that they have to work longer than others. It happens, and that's okay. But if if you're if you're doing it all the time, chances are, number one, you're not. It's because you're not making time for something that you should, like for your family, friends, whatever. Or number two, you're not working effectively during the hours you have, and you're trying to make up for it by working longer. And I did that for like the first two years of Red Hat. There are so many times. For example, yep. time zones. You're going to need to stop working in the evenings, even though the rest of the team in the US is pretty well with that. Yeah. Yes. So in which we are at one point, we need to be able to tell that sorry, it's yeah. 8 p.m. to my, my time, and I we need to do it for dinner. Yeah, that's an excellent point. If you work across with a team that is across many time zones. You may feel pressure to be there more often than you should. So yeah. Yeah. I want to because hey, yeah. colleagues are online. You love them, yeah. I mean, we we don't we don't just. This is the nice time when I can actually interact. With you. Yeah, you you work on it. You keep working on a team, not necessarily just because you love the work, but because you also like the people there, right? Most people who leave, it's not because of the work. It's usually because of the people. Often a manager, but also it can be coworkers. And you and by the same, you know, turn that around. People often stay because they love their coworkers, right? We do love each other because we build a relationship with each other. 
And so, you know, you may feel, you feel obligated because of that, but you, everyone needs to realize that we all have limits and we all need our downtime as well. So yeah, think about, again, if you, if you maximize your productivity during the time that you're there, you can limit the amount of times that, or you can limit the number of times or the, or the, the, um, uh, the number of times that you have to stay longer than you plan, right? And hopefully not do it very often. Again, work, you know, work smarter, not harder. All right, that's all I have. So thanks, guys, for. for <laughs>